cannot be forgiven without sacrifices. And to back this up, he reads the Yom Kippur service in the temple. Now friends, again, we have another disconnect. First of all, Yom Kippur never atoned for personal sin. Yom Kippur was only a national atonement. Also, if you read it carefully, sir, you would have noticed that this is a sin offering that is sacrificed for the people of Israel. A sin offering, a korban chatas, a sacrifice that is brought only for unintentional sins. And again, for intentional sins, only repentance would suffice. And stating that because Aaron confessed all the sins of the Jewish people shows that it was for intentional sins is also a bit funny. I mean, can you really imagine how long it would take for him to confess all the sins of the Jewish people they committed? That year, even by some miracle, he knew them all. No, friends, this was a confession of the nation's sin. But not in the manner that he explained. Not forgiving us for what we did as a nation, but rather for forgiving us for what we didn't do. And if you didn't notice, nowhere in the passage does it state that this goat was sacrificed. But rather it states that it was made to wander off. So again, how does this compare to Jesus dying on a cross again? And if this is the only example you could find, just shows me how desperate you were for sources. And then he claims that in the New Testament, Jesus is compared to the scapegoat. I hope that he knows that a goat and a lamb are not in the same family. But really, you could compare Jesus to any animal you want. But know that by doing so, won't make your case any more valid. Oh, and I'm sure you know that because you said that you understand Judaism, that even the Paschal Lamb wasn't a sacrifice for sin. And even if it was, which it wasn't, how could a Gentile benefit from a biblical sacrifice done in his behalf anyways? Because he even acknowledged that the law doesn't apply to non-Jews. And the speaker said that I said my reference in Hosea is referring to Babylon, which I never stated. I stated the Paschal is referring to our current exile, referring to how God will accept for sacrifices the prayers of our lips. And then he said that Hosea could be translated many different ways. Well, the truth is that it cannot be translated many different ways, but that it has been intentionally mistranslated by the New Testament book of Hebrews to prove the Christian point. And I'm not just going to throw blind facts at you, I'm going to prove it in a way that you don't even have to know Hebrew to understand. Compare. And you call this divinely inspired? And then my Christian critic claimed that the prophet mentioned in Deuteronomy 18 is clearly, clearly referring to Jesus. Now friends, one thing we have to keep in mind when reading the Bible is in what context are prophecies or laws given. Because to think that when God said to the Israelites that he would raise up a prophet like Moses, that he was referring to Jesus of Nazareth, and they would have known this instead of assuming it was Moses' successor, Joshua, is really stretching it. Why? Because it states, The Lord said to me, What they said is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth. And after this, we see, as it states in Joshua 3, 9, And Joshua said unto the children of Israel, Come here and hear the words of the Lord your God. His words. And if Jesus was not just a man, but God himself, shouldn't the prophecy not make the distinction between God's words and the prophet's words? If he is God himself, when it even states in Joshua 1 5, as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you nor forsake you. It was clearly talking about Joshua, just like I said in Joshua 3 7. And God said unto Joshua, this day will I begin to magnify you in the sight of all of Israel. They may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. So clearly Joshua was a more likely candidate than Jesus of Nazareth. Not to mention that the Torah is clear that if the supposed prophet's predictions do not come true, he is a false prophet. Like Jesus said in Luke 9.27, But I tell you the truth, there are some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. Clearly a false prediction. Or in Matthew 24.34, when Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. And don't forget what the verse stated, that this prophet will be like Moses. So, a little common sense is in order here. Throughout all of Jewish history, is every Christian ready to say that Jesus was the closest prophet we had to Moses? Right? I mean, not the prophets who physically led the Jewish people, who got them to abandon idolatry and return to the Lord. Friends, this was the mission of almost every prophet in the Hebrew Scriptures. And yet, Jesus in some way in his three-year ministry equals up? And we even see that Muslims 
claim that this is referring to Muhammad and the Mormons claim that this is referring to Joseph Smith. So the Christians are new here. But I would say that the most convincing verse on how Jesus is, is not the prophet in Deuteronomy 18 is Deuteronomy 13 verse 1 through 4. If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears to you and announces to you a miraculous sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder of which he has spoken takes place, and he says, let us follow other gods and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commandments and obey him, serve him and hold fast to him. Yes, friends, and if you notice, at the end, it tells us to keep God's commandments and obey only him. And being that Jesus did away with the commandments, I think this answers your question. But then the speaker will say, oh, well, that Jesus didn't abolish the law, he fulfilled them. Look, what's the difference? Are they being kept by believers anymore? No, so they're abolished. And especially when the Lord said that these laws were forever. But again, we know that forever is not a word that Christians like very much. Then my Christian critic claims that there was no historical evidence that ever refers to a virgin birth prior to the rise of Christianity. Really, my friend? So what's this? The ants go marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. The ants go marching one by one, hurrah, hurrah. The ants go marching one by one, the little one stops to suck his thumb. And they all go marching down, around, underground. <laughs> Go marching two by two, hurrah, hurrah. The ants go marching two by two, hurrah, hurrah. The ants go marching two by two, the little one stops to tie his shoe. And they all go marching down, around, and under the ground. <laughs> And has a speaker ever asked himself, what is Isaiah 714 really saying? And in what context is it really speaking? Well, friends, if you're a Christian, this may be a bit shocking to hear. But the Bible, my friends, does not revolve around the idea of a Messiah, either Jewish or Christian. No, friends, the Bible is a guidebook created only for us to know how God acts in history. So what? So that we can learn to emulate him. So if you study scripture like this, then you can actually learn how to behave and live life properly instead of looking for a heavenly bailout on every page. Because this is not how the righteous behave. No, friends, people who study scripture in such a manner don't want godly ethics. What they want, my friends, is a lottery ticket. And sir, you are free to believe whatever you want, but I'll be damned if I stay here and let you mislead others. Because Isaiah 7.14 is not referring to Jesus, and I'm going to do something that you probably never heard of, I'm going to read the passage in context. And it came to pass in the days of Ahaz, son of Jotham, son of Uzziah, king of Judah, that Rezin, king of Aram, and Pekah, son of Remaliah, king of Israel, marched on Jerusalem to wage war against it. And he could not wage war against it. And it was told to the house of David, saying, Aram has allied itself with Ephraim, and his heart and the heart of his people trembled as the trees of the forest tremble because of the wind. Friends, if you understood what I just read carefully, you would know that Judah was on the verge of destruction. Syria and Ephraim had joined forces to wage war. And those who trusted on the Lord were about to be conquered. And you know why? Because of their sin. And unlike Israel today, they knew it. But there's more. And the Lord said to Isaiah, now go out toward Ahaz, you and Sharyashev, your son, to the edge of the conduit of the upper pool, to the road of the washer's field. And you shall say to him, feel secure and calm yourself. Do not fear and let your heart not be faint because of these two smoking stubs of firebrand, because of the raging anger of Rezim and Aram and the son of Remilia. Since Aram planned harm to you, Ephraim and the son of Remilia, saying, Let us go up against Judah and provoke it, and annex it to us, and let us crown a king in its midst, one who is good for us. So said the Lord God, Neither shall it succeed, nor shall it come to pass, 
And the Lord continued to speak to Ahaz, saying, Ask for yourself a sign from the Lord your God. Ask it either in the depths or in the heights above. And Ahaz says, I will not ask. I will not test the Lord. And he said, Listen now, O house of David. Is it little for you to weary men, that you weary my God as well? Therefore the Lord of his own shall give you a sign. Behold, the young woman is with child, and she shall bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. Cream and honey he shall eat when he knows to reject bad and choose good. For when the lad does not yet know to reject bad and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread shall be abandoned. Do you see it? Do you see what happened, friends? The Lord is getting involved. In verse 3 it stated that God told Isaiah to go to King Ahaz, you and your son Shariashev, right? You first have to ask, friends, why did God ask him to take his son with him? Now, only having the English in front of you will confuse you a bit, but in Hebrew you'll see the answer, my friends. The reason he wanted Isaiah and his son to go to the king was because in Hebrew, Shar Yashav means a remnant will repent, they will return to the Lord. And Isaiah means God is here to help. And this is exactly what it shows in chapter 10, verse 21, right? It states, a remnant will return, a remnant of Jacob will return to the Almighty. Though your people, O Israel, be like the sand by the sea, only a remnant will return. It specifically says, it uses the word Shar Yashav. But that's not it. It says, friends, I'll give you another sign. Behold, the young woman is with child, and she shall call his name Emmanuel. What he meant by this was that when the child is born, you will know that God is on your side. When he first was on the other side because of our sin. But now, my friends, God is with us. We see that. This prophecy was fulfilled in 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 7 through 8, referring to the same event. It says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of the king of Assyria and the vast army with him. For there is a greater power with us than with him. With him is only the arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people gained confidence for what Hezekiah the king of Judah said. This, my friends, is clearly a sign of our Lord's great mercy and kindness to those who trust in him. And I will not sit by while the church tries to pervert it by trying to make it justify some pagan virgin birth. And pagan, like I just proved, it is. And it's clearly a perversion to the point that we even see that they try to reword it to justify the cause of Jesus, right? Jesus who actually came 700 years down the road. Here you see that Christian Bibles actually put the verse in the future tense trying to justify their cause, stating that a woman will be with child. Not how it's clearly written in the Hebrew in the present tense, that a young woman is with child. And they even change it to say that they will call his name Emmanuel instead of saying what it says in scripture that she will call his name Emmanuel. And we even see that Joseph doesn't even call him Emmanuel, but Jesus. And have you ever even stopped and really thought about it and understood how despicable the Christian claims are, right? That God would have sexual relationships with a betrothed woman right? Thereby causing her to violate one of God's commandments, one of his own commandments, for which she would be liable to receive the death penalty for. And if this is really a prophecy referring to Jesus, what happened to the rest of the prophecy? Or do Christians just toss that out also? How about her calling his name Emmanuel? Because we know it was Joseph who named him Jesus and not Emmanuel. And it says, curds and honey he shall eat. When did the New Testament state that Jesus ate curds and honey? It says that when he knows to refuse evil and choose good. Now, could Jesus, if he was sinless, choose evil as opposed to good? And then it says the two kings you have a horror from will be forsaken. Where in the New Testament do we find these two kings? Huh? Divinely inspired, huh? Then the speaker claims that he understands Judaism and I don't understand Christianity. <laughs> First of all, anyone who has followed my work knows that I'm very well versed in Christianity, but he must remember that it is Christianity that is the offshoot of Judaism, not the other way around. In other words, it is Judaism that must validate Christianity, and again, not the other way around. So quoting New Testament scripture doesn't justify your cause in any way. And then he stated that, I have a wrong understanding of the Trinity. Well, in my previous video, I stated that the Trinity was three independent beings or gods making up one God, honestly. Was I off? Because even Webster defines it as the union of three persons in one Godhead or the threefold personality of one divine being. Now, 
Is there really a difference, my friends? No, the problem is that Christians view the Old Testament with New Testament glasses instead of the other way around. Friends, it's time to wake up and put newer, flimsier belief systems behind and embrace Torah Judaism.